I want to save response to some of those specific points uh, for, for the next uh, little go-round, but uh, read a prepared uh, statement I came up with, and we'll see where it goes from here. Dr. Craig often appeals to the consensus of New Testament scholars on behalf of conservative views. By contrast, I am glad to confess that the opinion of the majority of scholars makes no difference whatever to me. Uh, in, the wor in fact, in the Gospels, after all, it's a consensus of scholars in the Sanhedrin that condemns Jesus to death. Uh, as Francis Schaeffer used to say, you can't settle the question of truth by a majority vote. I think uh, Martin Luther and Galileo and others knew that too. Uh, if I am interested in a question, I must examine the issues for myself. I reject, for example, Velikovsky's astronomy, not because the academy sneers at it, which I guess they do, but because his methodology seems flawed to me as I understand it. And forgive me, but so does Dr. Craig's. First, let me call attention to two fundamental axioms of Dr. Craig's work. The first is what strikes me as a kind of double truth model. The second is the old red herring attempt to evade the principle of historical analogy by means of the claim that critics reject miracle stories only because they espouse philosophical naturalism. The second follows from the first, and both commit the fallacy of ad hominem argumentation even while projecting it onto the opponent. I think he tips his hand toward the, first, the end of the first chapter of his book, Reasonable Faith. Uh, he draws a distinction there between knowing Christianity is true and showing that it is true. He says, what then should be our approach in apologetics? It should be something like this. My friend, I know Christianity is true because God's Spirit lives in me and assures me that it is true. And you can know it too because God is knocking at the door of your heart, telling you the same thing. If you are sincerely seeking God, then God will give you assurance that the gospel is true. Now, to show you it's true, I'll share with you some arguments and evidence that I really find convincing. But should my arguments seem weak and unconvincing to you, that's my fault, not God's. It only shows that I'm a poor apologist, not that the gospel is untrue. Whatever you think of my arguments, God still loves you and holds you accountable. I'll do my best to present good arguments to you, but ultimately you have to deal not with arguments, but with God himself, page 48. A little further on, he saith, Unbelief is at the root a spiritual, not an intellectual problem. Sometimes an unbeliever will throw up an intellectual smokescreen so that he can avoid personal, existential involvement with the gospel. Uh, pages 49 to 50. Dr. Craig then freely admits his conviction arises from purely subjective factors. To me, it sounds no different in principle from the teenage Mormon door knocker. He tells you he knows the Book of Mormon was written by ancient Americans because he has a warm, swelling feeling inside when he asks God if it's true. Certain intellectual questions have to receive certain answers, then, to be consistent with this revivalistic, heart-warming experience. So Dr. Craig knows in advance that, for example, Strauss and Bultmann must have been wrong. And by hook or by crook, he'll find a way to get from here to there. His enterprise is circular since he grounds Christian belief upon a subjective state described already in Christian theological terminology, God's spirit dwelling in his heart, etc. Dr. Craig seems to admit that he holds his faith on purely subjective grounds, but maintains that he's lucky to discover that the facts, objectively considered, happen to bear out his faith. Whereas theoretically his faith might not prove true to the facts, in actuality, it does. In any case, it's obvious from the same quotes that the arguments are ultimately beside the point. If an unbeliever doesn't see the cogency of Dr. Craig's brand of New Testament criticism, the same thing exactly as his apologetics, it can only be because the doubter has some guilty secret to hide and doesn't want to repent and let Jesus run his life. If one sincerely seeks God, Dr. Craig's arguments will mysteriously start looking pretty good to him. Dr. Craig's frank expression to his fellow evangelists and apologists is quite revealing. He tells you to say to the unbeliever that you find these arguments really convincing. 
But how can Dr. Craig simply take this for granted unless, as I'm sure he does, he knows he is writing to people for whom the cogency of the arguments is a foregone conclusion? They are arguments in behalf of a position his readers are already committed to as an a priori party line. His is a position that exalts voluntaristic decision above rational deliberation. Uh, rational deliberation, though good, is by itself not good enough for the evangelist because it can never justify a quick decision such as Campus Crusade's booklet The Four Spiritual Laws solicits. Every one of Dr. Craig's scholarly articles on the resurrection implicitly ends with that little decision card for the reader to sign to invite Jesus into his heart as his personal savior. He's not trying to do disinterested historical or exegetical research. He's trying to get folks saved. I know the feeling. I used to be the president of my intervarsity chapter. Note how he characterizes people who do not accept his version of the historical Jesus as unbelievers who merely cast up smoke screens of insincere carping. But this functions as a mirror image of his own enterprise. His apparently self-effacing pose, if my arguments fail to convince, then I must have done a poor job of explaining them, just reveals the whole exercise to be a sham. The arguments are offered cynically, whatever it takes. If they don't work, take your pick between brimstone, God holds you accountable, and treacle, God still loves you. I'm not saying Dr. Craig is wittingly distorting the truth to win his point. Obviously he's not. But he is so committed to a dogmatic party line that he cannot see truth as meaning anything but that party line. Just as Kelly a moment ago said that truth ought to mean a person, not an abstract concept. In Dr. Craig's lexicon, you look up truth and it says, see gospel. To borrow Francis Schaeffer's terminology again, for the apologist, truth becomes merely a connotation word. Just as liberal theologian Albrecht Ritchell said, Jesus has the value of God for us, the apologist might say, Christianity has the value of truth for us. Just as William James said that righteous endeavor was the moral equivalent of war, for apologists, Christianity is the moral equivalent of truth. Only it doesn't work. For Richleyanism, Jesus was, in fact, not God. For William James, moral endeavor was not, in fact, war. Even so, anything that substitutes for the truth may be preferred to the truth, but then it's a fiction. If the charge that unbelievers are hiding behind a smokescreen is a mirror image of the apologist's own strategy, then the naturalistic presuppositions business is a specific instance of such childish, I know you are, but what am I tactics. Does it take a blanket presupposition for a historian to discount some miracle stories, like Elisha's axe head on the one extreme or, or the resurrection of Jesus on the other, as legendary? No, because as Bultmann recognized, there is no problem accepting reports even of extraordinary things that we can verify as still occurring today, like faith healings and exorcisms. However you may wish to account for them, you can go to certain meetings and see scenes resembling those in the Gospels. So it is by no means a matter of rejecting all miracle stories on principle. Biblical critics are not like Carl Sagan or James Randi, going into every investigation already convinced that the paranormal must be a fraud. No, they take miracle stories on a case-by-case -case basis. But such a selective, piecemeal and probabilistic acceptance of miracle stories is not what apologists want. They take umbrage that biblical critics do not wind up accepting any and all biblical miracles. So, if it would not require a blanket principle to reject the historicity of particular mir miracle stories, we must ask if it would take a blanket principle to require acceptance of all biblical miracles. Clearly it would, and that principle cannot be mere supernaturalism, that is openness to the possibility that miracles can occur.
One can believe God capable of anything without believing that he actually did everything anybody may say he did. One can believe in the possibility of miracles without believing that every reported miracle must have occurred. No, the requisite principle for accepting all biblical miracles is the principle of biblical inerrancy. The belief that all biblical narratives are historically accurate simply because they appear in the Bible.